Good morning. Let's go ahead and get started with uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce one of our chief uh, residents, Dr. Juan Marcano. Uh, Dr. Marcano uh, grew up in uh, Caracas, Venezuela, went to medical school and did his general surgery residency there, uh, and uh, was in practice, uh, then emigrated to our country and uh, did a non, uh, non-accredited fellowship in CT surgery at uh, Houston and then came over to join us uh, here. Uh, when he finishes, you are going? Back to Houston. Back to Houston. Back to Houston. All right. Uh, please help me uh, welcome him as he tells us about the pancreas. Thank you, sir. Morning. Thank you, Dr. Schoenig, for that kind introduction. I'll do my best to do the presentation in English. Um, Not as bad as it took me five years to figure out which was the bottom. Uh, eat what you can, sleep what you can, and don't mess with the pancreas. And everyone that is involved in general surgery uh, uh, is a heard of these um, words in any in any way. And the pancreas is a fascinating organ. And uh, I'm going to do my best and uh, to, from the resting at some point, and based on my very humble review, to talk some, uh, go through some of the topics that I think they're important for us as a general surgery residents about uh, pancreas, and specifically about pancreatic uh, cancer. I have no financial disclosures, and I would like to thank Dr. Ledesma that he was kind enough to provide me with uh, very updated uh, literature about to be able to do this review. The, um, I'm going to try to uh, cover the uh, gene uh, genetics and implications of therapy in pancreatic cancer, the screening, the imaging evo uh, evaluation, the staging system, um, surgical therapy, the post-pancreatectomy complications and management, and something that is very, very, uh, in, in everyone in every surgical meeting in the country right now, about the ERAS, which is known as, as the acronym for Enhanced Recovery Pathway After Surgery. Pancreatic cancer is a lethal disease. It's, uh, for the 2016 report, it's already the third leading cause of cancer-related death in the United States. And the prediction is, is actually it's going to be the second cause by 2020. Uh, we had 53,000, almost 50, uh, 54,000 new cases for to, uh, last year. And the estimated death is 40, uh, almost 42,000. And that's, this is the most updated uh, numbers about it. Surgical uh, therapy is still being the best therapy. The problem is most of the patients, by the time that we um, patient gets diagnosed, the disease is already unresectable. Uh, there's been a lot of research, a lot of discussion, a lot of um, uh, change, trying to change on the paradigm of management. And there's a new uh, concepts like, for example, the borderline pancreatic cancer, or which are we want to talk about, and basically are cancers that we think with neoadjuvant therapy can be susceptible to surgical management. Regardless, there's lack of proven methods for early, early screening or early detection. Uh, we are not lucky enough to have with pancreatic cancer, same thing that we have for breast cancer, colon cancer, and uh, all these types of more common cancer. Uh, many, many, many people uh, had, that we know, and very people that's very well known, have died from ca uh, pancreatic cancer. So the problem with pancreatic cancer is basically the diagnosis. It's not necessarily access to care, and not necessarily about symptoms and stuff. Uh, Sally Ride, which was the first American woman to be on the space, which with uh, every three months physical exams by NASA, actually died from pancreatic cancer. With, uh, by the time she was diagnosed, she was not treatable. Um, the first uh, African-American lady that actually went to five Olympics, well, by the time she was diagnosed, she didn't even have high blood pressure, and she would die shortly after diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Herman Moser was dead already, but he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and actually she, he died shortly after. Pavarotti, there was concerns. He was doing really good, but suddenly started losing weight which initially they thought was a good thing, and then they realized he had pancreatic cancer, and he died shortly after. 
Ralph Steinman, which is a very no, well known, not much for us, but it's very well known by immunologists, is a Nobel Prize where actually he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2007, and he is a very well known immunologist in New York. And he moved all his uh, therapy and all his research efforts to try to figure out an immunology therapy for pancreatic cancer. And he developed a model where uh, he thought that dendritic cells can actually, as a macrophages, can actually uh, attack the pancreatic cancer. He, um, uh, uh, these efforts in this study actually gave him the Nobel Prize, which uh, he died three days before the Nobel Prize actually was announced. And all the, the, his, um, his um, efforts and, and, all, and actually the prize was donated for research. And there's many, many, many other uh, people that die from pancreatic cancer. And it's actually interesting, Dr. Solinger died of pancreatic cancer. Uh, La Guardia, which was a mayor that um, got New York through the Great Depression, actually died of pancreatic cancer. And the list goes on and on and on. And there's people that has all the resources and all the access to the latest technology of any time they were diagnosed, and there was nothing that couldn't be done for them. And Steve Jobs went to the iCloud in 2011 because of uh, pancreatic cancers as well. Pancreas is a very fascinating organ. And as we know, it's a small gland. Uh, it's just roughly 15 centimeters, between 60 and 100 grams. So you wouldn't imagine that actually such a small gland can have such of a deep impact on the body. The Greeks uh, knew the pancreas, and uh, the translation from Greek means all flesh. Initially, it was believed that was just tissue, you know, to protect the vessels. Galen for, uh, thought that was this is not to protect the vessels. Actually, this is just a cushion from the stomach. And the, this is because if you see the location of the pancreas, it's on the upper abdomen and it's surrounding to very uh, important structures were laid down over the most important vessels from the abdomen, protected by the stomach, and uh, pretty much every um, structure that is close to the pancreas is important. If we go back, we knew that we have known the pancreas for a long time, and 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 we're in 1642. And even the, the history of pancreas is controversial, and is, uh, you can actually write a, uh, and make a movie about the pancreas. Uh, Wilson was working in an uh, inmate that hanged himself. So the body, no one claimed the body, so he was working on the, open the body and started sewing the pancreas and did the first anatomical description of the pancreas. At that time, everyone was, you know, everyone was working on different things across Europe, and what he decided is all his findings got imprinted in plates. And he sent all the plates around Europe to share to the rest of his colleagues what uh, was his description, he thought, was the, the, um, the uh, uh, structure of the pancreas. Um, Wilson actually was murdered, too, in 1643 by a gentleman uh, of uh, last name of Cambier, which this, uh, he was murdered because they were fighting about who he actually described the pancreatic duct. After he died, uh, Wilson used to have a, a medical student uh, by the last name of Hoffman, which actually he claimed that he, not Wilson, was the person that actually discovered the pancreatic duct. Ragnero Graf, that we all know about his discoveries on the uh, um, female uh, reproductory system, actually was the first person that uh, studied the pancreatic secretion and used a, a goose quill inserted on the pancreatic duct to actually extract the secretions and uh, study the fluid. Bernard showed the digestive capability for pancreatic juice for fat, carbohydrates, and proteins. In Langerhans, which actually at that time was a medical student in Berlin, in Germany, uh, described and did a dissertation by the time he was going to get his title of, of a, a doctor about the, the um, islets on the pancreas. And um, Pavlov, which I know looks like Babajuski, but it's not, uh, is very well known because of his conditional reflex description, but actually he was probably the first modern physiologist. The first person that actually used a full physiology laboratory where everyone worked as a team and everyone had a specific um, 
uh, function and then all that get integrated with meetings, daily meetings at the end of the day. And um, he uh, studied a model to, uh, and was the, one, the, fir the first one that described the secretion of the pancreatic secretion actually can be controlled just either for a gastric simulation or for the GI simulation. We, now we know and we actually know the hormones and all the stuff. Uh, he published his uh, 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 work in 1897, but you know at that time it was published in Russian, so no one really uh, knew much about it. But then in 1902, actually was uh, translated to English. Uh, Alfred Nobel died in uh, 1896, and uh, uh, Pavlov got the Nobel Prize in 1902. Um, um, because of his findings. Bailey's and a starling, uh, and a starling, we know a starling because of his starling law, but actually starling was a, another of a big, 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 and probably the only big physiologist that never got a, a, a Nobel Prize. Uh, the, uh, they actually demonstrated the presence of a chemical uh, messenger that actually was able to regulate the secretion of the pancreas, and these he used a very, uh, very funny word to describe it and call it hormones. So he was the first one that described the hormones, and as you can see so far, a lot of the things that we know of medicine is being derived from or uh, uh, to be eager actually to know more about the pancreas. He is a, he never won the uh, uh, Nobel Prize, and they think it's because at that time it was a World War, and he was actually pro-Nazi, and they think that's a that that's a historical reason why he never got the the um, the uh, 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 Nobel Prize, and actually it's a very well known historical Nobel Prize controversy. Another controversy on the pancreas. So Banting and um, this gentleman here, Banting, was a fresh uh, medical uh, fresh doctor that graduated from University of Toronto in Canada. And uh, the, the, at that time, everyone knew about all the, the uh, uh, work that was being done on pancreatic duct. And there was uh, this thought process that actually, if, if you ligated the pancreatic duct, the acid our cells actually were going to atrophy. And so he thought, well, if we try to get those secretions away from the GI tract, we probably wouldn't be able to isolate the um, uh, pancreatic uh, secretions itself. So he um, talked to uh, MacLeod, which was already well-known researcher in the University of Toronto, and MacLeod assigned to him a, a dog, Best, which was actually a med student rotating in the lab. And Best helped Banting to uh, set up the lab, and then, just by coincidence, Colip, which was a chemist, uh, chemist that was actually doing a sabbatical year at the University of Toronto, joined, and between Bess and Colip, were able to isolate the molecule and the, of insulin. The, um, they both got the Nobel Prize. They got mad to each other, and there was a huge fight because he said that he should have the Nobel Prize too, and he was mad that he didn't want him to be part of the Nobel Prize. This is, in, in the history, the most, uh, the fastest ever uh, application from a finding on the lab to the actually, uh, uh, actual patients. So basically was discovered in 19, uh, at the beginning of 1922, uh, was coming from pork. Uh, uh, cells was used in, in, sorry, at the middle of 1921 and was already being used in 1922. And at the end of 1922 was used already in the United States as a therapeutic measure for diabetes. Um, and we can continue to, to, to go uh, talk about Nobel Prizes and people. For example, uh, Dr. Sanger actually studied the pancreas. He isolated the molecular structure, got an Nobel Prize. Uh, mechanism of, a pack of a cell secretion, guess what? Pancreas. First radioimmunase ever done, study on the pancreas. So pancreas has been studied for a while, and um, I think uh, is, is uh, and we talk, and we have this discussion at the end of my presentation, we still, there's a lot of things we still don't know, and if you go back 10 years, 20 years, there's still things that uh, we are doing the same because we don't really know 
um, what can be done different to have a better outcome. Genetics and pancreatic cancer. Why genetics is important? Well, we think that, uh, as we're going to talk about it, if we can f identify something that can, we can target, probably we can do an early diagnosis or early screening and try to catch these patients early. President Jimmy Carter's brother actually died from pancreatic cancer, as well as his two uh, um, sisters. So if you get this kind of patient, the question is, what can you offer to this patient who has so high risk to try to detect the patient's going to develop pancreatic cancer? Um, there's been a lot of efforts. Pancreatic um, adenocarcinoma is being identified now with genetic studies. So there's a lot of areas uh, where there's chromosomal issues, mainly alteration, satellite instability, epigenetic silencing, and intergenic mutations. There's four genes that are being isolated, and they're the most common. The KRAS, which actually is a, a sarcoma gene that actually uh, is a, from on the cell cycle, basically, whenever it's activated, doesn't do the check. Uh, and even if it's error on the cell, sex, uh, cell cycle keeps going and going and going. It's being identified 95% of, of the patients have pancreatic adenocarcinoma. The CDKN2A, again, 95%. And um, these, uh, when it's activated, increase the phosphorylation of a gene called RB1, and this affects the, shell point, the checkpoint, again, between G1 and S1 on the cell cycle. P53, 75% um, of patients. There's been a lot of work on P53. The problem is that P53 has been identified in so many cancers, it's very difficult to isolate if it's, this is uh, something that can be targeted from pancreatic cancer or something else. SMAD4, 55% and trans is uh, related to transcription growth factor beta. Again, uh, this is uh, being identified in patients that has, uh, more commonly in patients have pancreatic, uh, metastatic pancreatic cancer, and they think can be related to lay, late expression of the disease or to the mechanism actually for pancreatic cancer uh, metastasis. There's new genes that are being identified, and there's a trend now that uh, on these genes that we have here that we already know in there, we have a specific therapy that are more present in other cancers. So there are being studies to see of these patients that have these genes, that they have these cancers, what's the incidence of pancreatic cancer to see if there's any targeted therapy. For example, if you have a patient who has pancreatic cancer and has HER2 and you give him trastuzumab, what will be the response to those patients to his pancreatic cancer if you do? Because these mechanisms are not clear, but the, the investigators know that actually there's not a single pathway. There's a communication between multiple pathways and multiple mechanisms. Screen for pancreatic cancer. Um, as we know, it's pancreatic cancer is fatal, sooner the diagnosis, better prognosis. The problem is the overall incidence is low and cost effective, uh, and the screening is not really cost effective. Like if you do colonoscopies or if you do mammograms, the average uh, uh, cost for diagnosis is, over is close to $19,000 per patient. And the, better thing that, the best thing that we're able to do so far is try to identify the individuals that have high risk. Basically, patients have history, a strong family history of pancreatic cancer or any other genetic syndrome that can be related to pancreatic cancer. And these individuals are approximately 10% of all the patients that have pancreatic cancer, and they're being divided into different categories. Uh, patients that have hereditary cancer syndromes that have increased risk for malignancy, not just for pancreatic cancer, for any other cancer. The problem is for pancreatic cancer, you die. The rest of the cancer, so there's a lot of things that we can do different. And patients have familial and pancreatic cancer, which basically patients are identified after genetic studies. They have two or more first degree relative with uh, biopsy proven pancreatic cancer. Smoking is a non related factor. Uh, and there is a, a strong observational association between smoking and pancreatic cancer with a ratio of 3.7. Also, it's been seen that actually decreased the onset and patients have, that has been followed with a, uh, a hereditary pancreatitis to develop cancer uh, by 20 years. And the patient that has a family with pancreatic cancer should be strongly recommended to do not smoke. Uh, this is the most common um, 
genetic syndromes associated with cancer. And as you can see here, uh, this is the association, lifetime, uh, what we think so far that what we see in large population studies, what's the lifetime risk of archaeotic cancer. And besides the uh, hereditary pancreatitis and uh, familial atypical multiple mole melanoma syndrome, the risk is, is, is low. Uh, Pitts uh, Jagger syndrome is the, 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 and uh, familial uh, cancer are the two ones that actually has higher risk. For uh, hereditary pancreatitis, we were able to identify a gene which is autosomal dominant, but has incomplete penetration. Basically, it's a mutation of a serine receptor on chromosome 7 that encodes a cationic trypsinogen. And this patient has 50 to 60 times higher risk to develop pancreatic cancer. The thought process is they go to a vicious cycle they don't they, where they have recurrent pancreatitis, 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 and that chronic inflammatory uh, state is thought to create uh, atypia on the pancreatic cells. Uh, hereditary uh, breast cancer, where BRCA2 is being identified, up to 17% of the patient have a familiar, uh, familiar pancreatic cancer, and it's been associated a 3.5 increase, fall increase on um, incidence of pancreatic cancer. There is percentage of the people that actually doesn't have it, but actually has the PALV2 gene, which is a gene is uh, associated to is en encodes the VRC2 gene, and this is being targeted to and does be found to be between two and five percent. That's your syndrome, and actually this is a, a patient that we had the opportunity to take care, and this is that one of our patients has the typical hematoma, uh, mucosal lesions on the mouth. This is a patient that actually got uh, uh, colon perforation during the screening colonoscopy due to his pets jagger syndrome. So autosomal dominant, high risk for cancer in GI tract, lung, and breast, and up to 35% uh, risk for pancreatic cancer of, a, of 80 to be honest, on these kind of patients of the age of 80, they're going to have any kind of cancer. Um, so there's not a lot of uh, efforts. It's been being a lot of efforts on the screening, but the, the screening for this kind of patient is actually more complete, not necessarily targeted to pancreatic cancer. Lynch syndrome, as we know, um, a mismatch repair gene. They think the cumulative risk is 4%. But when they see the risk of pancreatic cancer in people that has Lynch syndrome compared with the general population, actually risk is almost nine times higher. So this is um, now being uh, looked at. Family and pancreatic cancer can be, there's some studies that show there's a risk up to 30% higher than the rest of the population to decrease pancreatic cancer. And this is directly or is being seen to be related to uh, also to the number of uh, familia, uh, individu family individuals that have the cancer. And this thing is related to the penetrance of the particular gene uh, problem. And you have five-fold uh, uh, risk, if increased risk if it's only one person, but you have op up to more than 30-fold uh, risk if you have three or more uh, family members that have pancreatic cancer. So, what do we do with these patients? There's not really a consensus, and there's a lot of uh, 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 papers that uh, they're very long and show a bunch of tables, very good looking tables, and at the end of the paper and the discussion says there's like no a strong recommendation. We know for pet yogurt syndrome that most of the patient, the onset of a patient, and when we see pancreatic cancer, most of the diagnosis is at the age of 45. So the recommendation uh, age of a screening is 30. And for familial and pancreatic cancer, most of the onset age is 65, so recommendation is uh, 50. Uh, and what do we need to order? And that is another uh, uh, hot topic. CT scan, it's uh, pancreat uh, with pancreatic protocol, which will be the ideal because enhance the uh, presence of mass on the pancreatic tissue is not recommended in the sense you cannot go across and, and take people from the street and get CT pancreatic protocol in anyone. Um, there is uh, being uh, the use of abdominal ultrasound has very low sensitivity and specificity to detect lesions that are less than two centimeters. And uh, there is not really a recommendation of what, okay, I think this patient uh, may have pancreatic cancer, has a high risk. So actually what were, is being done is a combination of three studies that we're going to talk about it. 
Uh, there was a recently published multicenter study that showed it, it, that look at 225 high-risk individuals with pancreatic cancer. And uh, after the diagnosis was done, they study, they look at the studies that were done to reach the diagnosis. And CT scan, conventional CT scan, only detected in 11% of the times, MRI in 33% of the time, and endoscopic ultrasound, 42% of the time. Serological testing, not really recommended, and not, uh, it is believed that whenever you have Elevation of CA, CA199, they use already in an advanced stage, so not necessarily work for, for uh, screening. Uh, patients that have cystic lesion for the pancreas have been a lot of discussion about sending pancreatic fluid for biomarkers, basically looking at gene mutations and changes in the gene and stuff. There is not large studies that actually uh, show that this is a is being show successful in selected patients, but there's no uh, large study. So basically, for, for screening, we rely heavily on imaging. And imaging is critical for detection, the seeing the feature of a pancreatic uh, mass, the initial staging, and then monitoring either the patient is a real candidate or not. There is a uh, journal, and then there's even a society for radiologists that only look at pancreas. So pancreas in imaging has been very challenging, and there's, uh, we're going to talk about the most common things, but there's a lot of the techniques and stuff that's been developed to try to increase our ability to detect early these lesions. The challenging things is especially when the uh, uh, mass is less than two centimeters and those masses are inside the pancreatic parenchyma that actually doesn't show any obvious changes in the morphology of a gland. The main thing that we do a CT scan, and this is our scanner down on the emergency department was going under maintenance, MRI, endoscopic ultrasound, and the PET CT. We always... Um, the dual phase CT is the one that's recommended from the most uh, uh, updated NCCN guidelines. Uh, it's basically because it's widely available. Every single hospital in the United States has a scanner and it's less costly. So what's a dual phase with a CT pancreatic protocol? Basically, it's a CT that has two phases of a contrast. The a late arterial phase, or known as a pancreatic phase, that actually allows you to delineate if there's any anormality in the, on the pan pancreatic Parenchyma also allow you to see the vessels, basically the SMA, which is the main one that's going to give you the criteria of resectability. In the portal venous phase, the standard protocol is after the contrast is given, you wait 65 seconds to give the contrast to do the late arterial phase, and then you do uh, 80 seconds to do the portal or venous phase. Here at the UH, your protocol is 25 and 80. So we give uh, take the arterial phase a little earlier and give them more time for the portal main. Uh, there has been a lot of discussions to how to um, make this better because time matters here by the time you give the contrast and by the time you give the scan and now there's an automatic system and most of the centers were actually they cal you uh, put in the VMI uh, of the patient and kind of roughly calculate based on the table what's a, a, the cardiac output and try to guesstimate what's the best time to give the contrast. No oral contrast is recommended regardless. It's recommended to give to the patient water or milk to distend the duodenum prior to study. It's known to be that just a, a cup of uh, uh, water or milk is uh, enough. There is now what we, uh, is called dual energy scanners, which are scanners that have two different uh, energy source, and they, uh, using different uh, amount of energy, they can detect uh, different changes comparing the amount of uh, the response of a tissue to different amount of energy. So this this, this being, uh, gets plugged to a computer, which actually does analysis and gives an image that actually can see difference on the um, uh, um, diffusion uh, coefe uh, coefficient of a tissue. MRI is superior uh, to uh, CT for detection of uh, tumors that actually don't change, uh, don't have a change on the anatomy of the pancreas, and also they can see subtle changes on the perivascular and peripancreatic uh, tissue. There is a 
very particular MRI uh, techniques that you can use. One is do called DWI, which is based on something called Brownian motion, which actually is very interesting, very, uh, very interesting, where basically they realize that, that when, as you know, MRI rely heavily on the amount, uh, amount of water that is contained on the tissue. So they realize when patients have tumor, there's a decrease uh, transit of fluid between the cells. So they uh, were able to quantify this and they can tell in, in a particular tissue, even though there's no obvious changes, if they detect there's a decrease in this water exchange, they can say that probably there's a mass there. And of course, the perfusion imaging. The CT PET um, role is unclear. Uh, for NCC guidelines, meaning that there's no strong indication when to do it and how to do it and when you want to do it. And basically, it's a combination of a regular CT, a CT scan, a PET scan, and then you get a CT PET. Uh, it's normally reserved for patients that are considered high risk or patients that use is borderline resectable disease. I want to talk about it in a little bit. Patients have very high CA199, and patients have large tumors that is difficult to assess if there is a lymph nodes around it. The, the mass. And this is an image of a CT pad um, with a positive uh, node. The CT pad, as you, uh, we know, uh, has been based on an observation that was done in 1900 where the neoplastic cells, because they have an uncontrolled growth, they use more glucose than the regular cells. So what we do is we mark those glucose cells with contrast, and uh, that's why these cells are called pet avid cells. Endoscopic ultrasound, which is widely available now, is the best performed by an expert, is the best resource we have to detect pancreatic masses. Um, pretty much um, what we do, the, the probe has an ultrasound, the, the scope has an ultrasound probe on the tip that is able to see um, the mass and evaluate the pancreatic duct, also has the ability to sample. Uh, and this is going to be a fine needle aspiration. Uh, no, a lot. The main complications for uh, endoscopic ultrasound uh, fine needle aspirations are pancreatitis and bleeding. The risk for bleeding is very low, and the risk for pancreatitis is low. Overall, risk is less than five percent, so it's widely used. Also, if it's an ex expert. Uh, operator that actually you can assess the blood vessels and you actually you're able to sample lymph nodes uh, using the endoscopic ultrasound. And uh, this later gets looked at on the microscope and the pathology can be able to tell you if what kind of cells you have there. Uh, what are the resectability criteria? Uh, basically the main three, three things that we look at is the tumor location, vascular involvement, and the presence of metastasis. Per NCNN guidelines, there's three types of, of uh, masses at the time of uh, diagnosis. Masses are resectable, what is called now borderline resectable, and what's locally advanced or not resectable. And as, as so we can remember over anatomy, pancreas, SMA, uh, SMB, uh, and basically what we're going to see is, uh, depending on the location of a mass, what is the involvement of all these uh, surrounding structures. When is considered resectable? When we think this, the patient is a, a, surgical, pa a surgical candidate. When there's you no know, evidence of uh, distant disease or uh, adenopathies, uh, ideally it needs to be a clear plane of fat identified between the pancreas and basically the SMA and also SMB to uh, uh, say that there's no real involvement of the vessels. And in case the SMB is involved, there should be, or, or the portal vein, there should be uh, less than 180 degrees, um, meaning that the mass is not encasing the vessel. This is a CT scan with a 3D reconstruction where you can clearly see this is celiac, this is SMA, and this is a mass, and you can see it's completely encasing the SMA. So this will be a patient that is not uh, resectable. Uh, this is a patient where actually the mass is involved in pretty much everything and won't be resectable either. Different centers based on the experience. We don't do these cases 
anymore as probably as Dr. Pestana or Dr. Sirnik used to do many of these pancreatic cases, the surgical therapy, is, uh, the numbers has is, is, is decreased so much. Actually, the excellence centers, even the excellence centers have lower case number required to be called excellence centers. And, uh, but there's, per imaging, there is a criteria where there's a study group that is trying to have everyone talking about the same related to pancreatic tumors. So there now is going to be uh, a standardized form that needs to fill up on the patient to get CT pancreatic protocol uh, with basically check marks and things that needs to be filled. Uh, resectable, as we know, no involvement or um, uh, borderline resectable, most important thing, less than an, an, um, less than 800, uh, 180 degrees. Uh, it's okay, it's actually more than 180 on the patient that have intact GDA because as we know, the collateral flow. And our resectable, of course, is when gonna be vascular involvement. Is any predictors? Well, um, pancreatic head tumors are more than three centimeters. Most of the time are not resectable. Tumors located on, located on the body on the tail due to the fact that the body actually lays over the vessels. Patients have over 100 uh, units for MLs of uh, CIN 189. I'm sorry for that typo. Patients that have uh, equivocal findings, meaning that you cannot clearly define the plane or you don't know if there's a clear involvement or lymph node or because of fuzziness or stranding around them, more likely this is advanced disease. A staging laparoscopy should be considered, and most of the big centers they do a staging laparoscopy for all these patients. Uh, what is borderline resectable tumors? Basically, tumors are confined to the pancreas with no laparoscopic or uh, imaging evidence that they have metastatic disease. There are tumors at the time of diagnosis are not deemed to be resectable, but because of a feature of the involvement just of very specific areas, likely can be resectable if they respond well to ne neoadjuvant therapy. Every center has different criteria to uh, identify these patients. This is the inter uh, intergroup trial. MD Anderson, MCC guidelines from 2015, we're actually looking at the vessels, more important as SMA, uh, but also they look at the, the uh, common hepatic artery, celiac trunk, and SME in portal vein. Um, and again, can, in, in, no matter what's the center, if you have encasement of SMA, there's game over. There's nothing that can be done. What is your goal for the, for the resection of these patients? So basically, uh, there's three, type of, three types of resection, and this is being reported uh, as reported after final pathology. R0, where there's no evidence of residual disease. R1, where there's microscopic disease. And R2, when uh, there's residual macroscopic disease. And what we're talking about now, they're moving forward to have a standardized uh, structure reporting where they're going to have to fill up these forms saying that uh, what are arterial involvement and all this stuff because the other problem is these patients sometimes get diagnosed in centers when they don't do pancreatic, um, uh, they don't do pancreatic surgery. When the patient gets referred to other centers, either report is incomplete, the images are not available, and sometimes these patients have to go back and get the image again. Um, when you have a suspected, a suspected uh, pancreatic cancer, CT or MRI, depending on what you have available. If it's deemed resectable, patient needs to go to endoscopic ultrasound, FNA. If continues to be resectable, there's no vessel involvement, doesn't look like there is uh, advanced disease, patient should go to surgery followed by neoadjuvant therapy. If the FNA is not diagnostic, you, sh you should repeat it before taking the patient or consider an intraoperative uh, biopsy before commit to actually a uh, full resection. If you think it's not unresectable, is the same patient is going to go for a EUA, where either if he has alternate diagnosis, should go on a route. If a patient is confirmed that it's unresectable, needs to go for palliation, which basically is a bare metal, uh, metal self-expanding stents and uh, chemo uh, radiation. What are the staging? 
most, uh, recent, most recent study for cardiac cancer. Um, magic <coughs> number is two, as we talk about. So T1 for lesions are two centimeters, T2 lesions above two centimeters, and everything else, if it's the iliacs, uh, the SMA is involved, or any of the celiac axis vessels, it's a T3, T4, whenever the tumor is uh, outside the gland. And the staging is, you know, a combination. Basically, we can operate for every uh, most of the time from a stage two B, uh, uh, stage three, and stage stage three is commonly uh, uh, can be borderline. Uh, most of the time, are borderline uh, uh, patients, and stage four are patients most of the time are not surgical. Just to refresh, this is the pancreatic um, lymph node. Basically, most of them along the curvature of the duodenum. Celiac axis, the one that follows the splenic vessels, and the one located right in this pouch beneath uh, the pancreas. Um, stage 1A, again, what we see here, just a two centimeter mass with no lymph nodes. More than two centimeters, no lymph nodes, so it's just a T2, uh, it's still being resectable. Stage 2A, which is sometimes confusing because the actual extent view of the pancreas, and most of the time we think it's a, it's a T3, where actually it doesn't matter if it goes this, because this is a surgical specimen, right? Uh, but there's no vascular and lymph node involvement. And uh, if you can see the difference between 2A and 2B, so 2A doesn't matter if it goes to the duodenum, but 2B, you are um, it's still uh, uh, kind of away from the vessels, but there's already lymph node involvement. Stage three, the mass basically migrated and it's involved in this case, we can see a picture, and then the picture is actually taking the celiac trunk. And the stage four, of course, that's <coughs> disease everywhere. What's a surgical therapy for these patients? And I'm gonna start backwards because Every single thing in pancreas is kind of controversial, and there, uh, all the data I'm gonna show, actually you can go either way, and there's no anything written on the stone, and it has to do with surgeon preference, center preference, but there's clear, strong evidence that there's no benefit for extended lymphadenectomy. Uh, Patients do the same, actually, sometimes the outcome can be worse, and there's a strong evidence that ERAS works for pancreatic cancer. So what are the outcomes? Overall survival is 8%, not really great. And a lot of people discuss actually if you should be even operating on these patients. Um, surgical patients, the um, survival, median survival is 25 months and the best numbers are being coded as 12 to 15%. Patients that have periampulary cancers, cholangiocarcinomas, and duodenal cancers that have a better uh, prognosis, but in all the cases, um, for the duodenal, it's the base is almost 60%. But in all the cases, for pancreatic itself, cancer is not great. By law of preserving versus the standard, there was four recent randomized controlled trial, trials that were to show there is no difference in short-term and long-term survival, morbidity, postoperative morbidity, operative time, blood loss, and hospital length of stay. Basically, this is because everyone uh, does always the same, so the people does classic always does classic, and so their, their outcome is, is not going to change. The people that does polaric preserving always do polaric preserving whenever they can. This is the four trials, and the, there's uh, in, in, you can see actually this is from big centers, but still the number of patients are low because we're not doing as many surgeries as before. A standard versus extended lymphadenectomy uh, does not improve survival and can increase operative time blood loss, and postoperative morbidity. <laughs> Controversial, if there's a group of patients that may benefit, I was not able to identify which specifically will be this group of patients, so I won't really make, do a mention or make a mention about it. Um, and this is the four most recent uh, uh, randomized control trial that we report about it. Pancreatic reconstruction. So a pancreatic reconstruction is a main step of a surgery that it's the main step of the surgery, but it's also the main driver for overall complications. R overall leak, uh, uh, risk for leak and fistula is 12 and 33 percent. 
And this is such a problem, there, there is something called the International Study Group for Pancreatic Fistula, where actually they uh, define, and this is an international definition, about pancreatic fistula as a fluid with amylase level greater than three times the upper normal level after post-op day three. And they, uh, they have, there's a classification, grade A, no clinical impact, grade B, clinical impact requiring treatment, a change of management. Basically, this is a patient to get percutaneous drain. And grade C, patients that have, require critical care and possibly require surgical management. Stomach or jejunum? Uh, there was a meta, this meta-analysis meta was recently published in 2015 that looked at seven randomized controlled trials will show no really difference, uh, but maybe increased bleeding on pancreatogastric anastomosis, but again, this was not really a strong evidence about it. Uh, you can see here, stomach, most of the people, again, there's uh, a lot of uh, personal preference on this, does it posterior, sometimes people does it on, along the greater curvature, more here in this area, and you can see here, pancreas is referred with uh, two silk stitches, the pancreatic duct is gonna be here, and this is the incision that you do in the posterior aspect of the stomach. The, uh, the most, uh, in the United States, the most commonly done is the pancreato jejunos, and there's three main techniques I bring described, the end to side, in two layers, the ductum mucosa, which is the warrant, is the standard, uh, and then Blumgard, which does um, mattress technique, and the invaginating anastomosis, which I never seen, and this is a picture where you open the jejunum, and as you can see, you basically invaginate the pancreas on it. Uh, this is from the uh, Toronto, the, uh, the University of Toronto have a video library where the, you can have free access of, um, of uh, the um, surgical interventions and videos they do, and they have very good video they talk about uh, the pancreatogejunosomy, and it's not commonly done anymore, so I think it was worth it just to bring a video so we can see exactly what they do it. Uh, this is a very standard technique when you divide the, the pancreas duct and the jejunum, then the jejunum in four quadrants. The second stitch will be immediately beside the first stitch but with the knot ultimately tied down on the inside. The first stitch will then be passed posteriorly between the pancreas and jejunum. The third stitch will be placed at the apex of the bowel and ductal vein. 